So hey, welcome everybody. To those of you that are just joining, we're gonna we're just gonna wait for um, one more minute to allow um, everybody to get into the room, the virtual room, and then we'll then we'll get going. Good. So we've got everybody's. I can see the panelists. Thank you very much, panelists, for sharing your your uh, cameras. And it looks like we have, yeah. Okay, so I think hopefully we've, you know, if anybody else um, is joining later, we could, we can let them in as they come. But if that's okay with you panelists, I think we should get going with the webinar. So thank you very much everybody for joining us and thank you to our panelists for giving up their time to come and talk about the, the interesting research that they're doing on, um, on, on this topic, which is called Beyond 2020, Tackling Stunting in India More Sustainably and Equitably. So, so it's really great that we've got, we're actually focusing on um, one of the Action Against Stunting Hub's um, key um, country context, which is, which is India, and we're going to see two um, really uh, interesting presentations from Patra Lake uh, Chatterjee and Sharika Yunus, who are who are going to be talking about different aspects of the of the um, challenges and, and impacts for stunting of 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 their work. Um, so, and really, what what, what we've what it's what what we've uh, how we've we've built this. Um, is that we're looking at, you know, we're two years on from the, the, the start of COVID-19 and we're, we're really wanting to make an assessment of how have the health and food systems um, changed. And so we, there are different um, methods that we can use. Perhaps we can, um, we can look at the voices from people in the field, um, whether they're people delivering important um, services like the the um, Anganwadi services, where um, feeding programs happen in India, or perhaps we can draw on the results from the national, the the macro level, the national family and health surveys, um, and of which there is a there has been a, a recent survey, I, I believe. Um, and so, what we've asked our speakers to prepare is to discuss on how to adapt a a long long term approach focusing up focusing on what interventions and activities can be trans and activations can be translated into longer term su successes in in um, addressing stunting and and uh, undernutrition um, so um, I would just like to say so for participants um, there is both you will there is both a q and a and a chat. So what, what we'd like you to do is, if as you're listening to the, um, the presentations, if there is a point that you'd like to get clarity on in a particular presentation, please can you put it in the chat? But if there's a more general point that you would like to the panelists to discuss, either one or both of them, um, at the end of the session, so that's the 15 minutes we have at the end for the for the discussion. Could you put that in the Q and A box? And I think the Q and A box is is only visible to the panelists, whereas the chat should be visible to everyone. Okay, so um, with that um, kind of stated, I think we should get on with actually the meat of this session and and listen to our our panelists. So, so first of all, we were really d delighted to to have Patraleka Chatterjee, um, and so if I'm just going to read Ch Patraleka's bio first, and then and then we'll ask her to take it away. So, so Patraleka is an award-winning jour journalist, con columnist, author, and consultant to international agencies focusing on development issues across multiple platforms. Um, so as a journalist and consultant, she's brought to the national and international consciousness the crucial importance of transdisciplinary factors in the provision of public health care. So this is something which the, 
the action against stunting hub is also focusing on so it's so it's really bang on on the money of of of, of what, what what we're about as well um, since the 1990s patrulaka has consistently foregrounded the role of economic political social cultural and educational factors in public health in india um, which is where she lives but she also um, has done work on on other in other developing countries and she extensively reported on India's child nutrition crisis for Indian and international publications, in, including The Lancet. And she's a visiting fellow at Global Health Justice Partnership of the Yale Law and Public Health Schools. So thank you very much, Patrulaka, please. Thanks, Hugh, and um, thanks for having me. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. And uh, before I start my presentation, I just wanted to say we're at a globally, we're at a, a very terrifying and very disturbing moment at the moment. I mean, all of us are watching these visuals from Ukraine and even thousands of miles away where I am in my local chemist, there were discussions on, you know, what the, how this would affect the, 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 the consequent petrol prices increase, how it will affect everything, including lives. And to me, this is also in a way what child nutrition is all about. Child nutrition, including the problem of stunting in India and elsewhere in developing countries, it's a very interconnected issue. It's not just about what you do as a nutrition intervention. Everything is going to affect, including petrol price hike on stunted children, on the malnutrition crisis. So that's, you know, that's a very, very broad context. And um, if I could start my presentation, Gun, is that, are you are you there? Yeah? Yeah, I can share my screen yeah. and your presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so my, um, can you see the presentation? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's the first first slide. The second one, yeah, second slide. Yeah, so this is actually before, the, I'll talk about this more. This is just a little bit, I'm a journalist and a writer. So most of my insights are really from the field. And this is some uh, a, a protest site of Anganwadi workers, which are the childcare workers who actually implement the major nutrition interventions of the government. This is a site in an adjoining state called Haryana, where they're protesting and they've been sitting here since December 8. So these are, and all the childcare, or most of the childcare centers in this state, Haryana is an affluent state, they're all closed at the moment. I'll get to this later, but just to give you a little, uh, uh, you know, kind of a glimpse of where, you know, where we are. So this was, I visited them just a few days ago. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, so, you know, we're talking about sustainable development goal, right? End hunger, achieve food security, improve nutrition, promote sustainable agriculture, make sure that by 2030, everyone, especially child, the children and the more vulnerable have access to sufficient nutritious food all year round. So that's the grand goal. That's the big picture. But what really matters for these children that we're talking about, millions of children who are stunted, who are at risk of, you know, uh, being stunted or wasted is really how it pans out on the ground in my view next slide yeah so india the story so far india is quite a i think in a quite a unique uh, case in the sense that um we've had remarkable economic growth in recent decades but poverty and food security are still areas of major concerns i mean i kind of you know very um I don't want to trivialize it, but in a way, I sort of think of superpower and, you know, stunted kids. And how, how do these two sync? And it's, if you haven't, if you've not visited India, it's not something very obvious because we're not necessarily a poor country in terms of resources. But look at some of the international indicators. 2016, India was 97 among 118 developing countries in the Global Hunger Index. 2021, that's India is 101 among 116 developing countries. Now, the Government of India statement, National Family Health Survey, which you know, I think Sharika will talk about it more, the latest one, has shown Im improvement in key, you know, in some key uh, indicators among children under five years of age. Stunting has reduced, but look at it, it's very marginal from 38.4% to 35.5%, you know, right? And the underweight has reduced. It's, it's very marginal. So we have almost like one third of, of children in India stunted. And most importantly, as I said, 
the thing to remember about India is that there is really no one Indian statistic. It's extremely difficult to talk about India. India is almost like a continent. So there are different parts of India, different states, different regions really, um, you know, behave, react differently, even different districts, even contiguous districts. So NFHS5, which is the latest National Family Health Survey, 11 out of 18 states for which data was released, stunting and wasting has actually increased. And um, this is something which I just picked out from a, a statement from the government think tank at the IO. While the food situation is progressively improving, access to balanced foods is problematic for the vulnerable population. And we have millions who come under the, you know, the, the label of vulnerable population. Balanced food means, you know, we have subsidized food. And I think, again, Sharika will talk about this more, you know, cereals. But what we don't have necessarily is nutritious food in, 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 in the, through the public uh, distribution system. Next slide, please. Yeah. So India implements one of the largest food security measures in the world, National Food Security Act. This actually came after a lot of struggle. 2013. It covers around 800 million people. That's 67% of the country's population. In addition, we've had the Integrated Child Development Services, I ICDS, under whom, you know, the Anganwadi workers and the helpers come. They're uh, aimed at addressing, you know, nutrition security of under six children, lactating mothers and pregnant women. Then we have national program of midday meals, you know, in, in schools, which aims to provide nutritious meals to children in primary schools, you know, and like this. But again, implementation is key, and currently it's extremely uneven across the country. Next slide, please. So, various schemes to tackle child malnutrition, the portion of Yarn, which is the government's flagship initiative to deal with it. It was earlier actually called the National Nutrition Mission. This is an acronym for Prime Minister's Overarching Scheme for Holistic Nutrition launched in 2018. It's a pan-Indian program. You can see the goals. It's there on the screen. It has a portion tracker. A lot of focus on digital, digital, uh, you know, digitalizing for real-time monitoring. Then there's a, pro a program to support development of portion vaticas and Anganwadi centers to meet dietary, dietary diversity gap of le uh, leveraging traditional knowledge. Nutritional practices also be taken up. Next slide, please. Again, Implementation, implementation, implementation. Because we have, you know, India has never actually uh, lacked in mission statements, vision statements, targets, you know, strategies, task forces, committees, you know, main it, you know, we've got them all. <laughs> and in every subject, not just nutrition, but this is the issue, you know, implementation. How does it, you know, there are macro level roadblocks and micro level roadblocks. And as a journalist, I actually believe in, you know, you can't really understand how a uh, intervention is planning out till you actually go and talk to people whose voices are necessarily not there or platformed in the big documents. Once again, state, as I said, so, as you, you know, this is actually a statement from the December 20, 2021 official statement of Press Information Bureau. Target of this Abhiyan is to reduce stunting in children from zero to six from 38.4% to 25%. This is, of course, not happened. Um, at the end of my presentation, there's a whole bunch of references where you can see all these references, you know, all these uh, places from which I picked up. One of the things one also must understand when we talk about India is that uh, the context. The vast majority of Indians, uh, working Indians, are part of the informal sector, which means they don't really get salaries. Um, they don't really have any contracts. They are not really in a position to negotiate anything. A very large number, we were talking about the most vulnerable sections. Now, even if that's 20%, 30%, or 35%, that still runs into millions because our population is 1.4 billion plus. Right. Now, there are huge numbers of people who actually are working right at the bottom with very little negotiating power. You know, they can't really hop from place to place or, you know, negotiate anything. You know, they just get whatever. And as we have seen, you know, through the pandemic, and I made, I've given actually several talks to various universities across the world on this, the urban poor, the poor have been very, very badly hit. Even now, though we don't have a national lockdown, uh, you know, there's always this focus on what happens after the national lockdown. Right now, we don't have a national lockdown. And even after the second 
second wave when we didn't have a national lockdown, but localized lockdown. The informal sector has been very badly hit. So recovery, as we see, is not really, it depends on from which angle you're looking at recovery. If you're talking the guy at the bottom, he's probably getting a quarter or half or a less than what you used to get, it, even in terms of a wage, you know, which to begin with is not actually a, 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 based on a contract. It's just whatever his boss gives him. Now, all that, of course, affects nutrition. Food budgets are the first to be cut, right? Okay, next slide. Yeah. So this is, this is as I mentioned, India is a hugely diverse country. The national average tells you very, very little, including stunting. There are huge, uh, you know, variations between regions and states, also between districts. Like take Uttar Pradesh, which is the most populous country, 200 million plus, size of Brazil. Um, it's India's also most politically powerful state. Some data, uh, you know, from the latest official, this is NFHS 5, which tell you that UP Sambal district, 51.6% children below five are stunted. This is official data. In the same state, Lalitpur district is another district, 46.6% children, same age group, are stunted. Madhya Pradesh and Central India, Satna, 49.4% under five children. Sir. Of course, this is North India, what we call the Hindi heartland, where the generally lags behind in you know, human development, which not just nutrition, but you know you will find linked associated indicators like healthcare, children's education, uh, sorry, mother's education, overall infrastructure, this is very different from, let's say, the southern India. I'm taking one of the best functioning states in terms of human development, Tamil Nadu, Coimbatore district, where the, the same corresponding figure for stunted, we're seeing 23%, right? Next, next slide. So you can't really understand what's happening in India just to the announcement, which um, I, I don't know whether this sounds cynical, but it's it's really essentially as expressions of intent. You know, this is intended to happen. That is intended to happen. You have to see how in these various interventions are actually playing out in the ground and the roadblocks and what the solutions, whether in the short term, medium term or long term, it will not be the same solution, you know, in, in every state or every district. So the important factors, as I say, you know, it, it's extremely important to see this as the overall governance, of course, the deepening inequality. There have been any number of reports which are actually talking about India's deepening inequality, joblessness. Joblessness, I would say, is not just salary job, as I mentioned, because the vast majority of Indians are working in the informal sector, but um, any kind of work which pays bills. Food inflation, extremely high, though we are actually self-sufficient in foods, but when it comes to people going and buying food, you know, it's it's very, very high. Um, I don't know the latest statistics, but I think January it was 10%. Budget cuts on nutrition in real terms. Again, there's been a lot of studies by civil society. I'll talk about it later. There've been actual budget cuts on nutrition in real terms. Human resources. This is an extremely important, I know, whether in the short term, medium term, long term, whatever you want to do, unless you strengthen the people, the foot soldiers, you're going to actually implement the program. Nothing is going to happen. Um, frequent, and, and we now have an additional challenge, which we don't talk about much. Frequent and erratic weather induced by climate change, which can potentially worsen the food security situation and have an effect on child nutrition because agriculture gets affected. An extremely critical factor, as I mentioned, is the status of frontline workers tasked to implement these new schemes. Currently, child um, care workers in more than one state, including Delhi, where I am, the national capital, and Haryana, which I visited, are on strike. I visited one protest site in adjoining state, Haryana, which is an affluent state. And you might have heard the capital of Haryana is Gurgaon, which is, well, you know, high tech hub. All the multinationals are there, just a few miles from all these, you know, the multiplexes and the malls and the, um, you know, the glitzy Gurgaon, you have these Anganwadi workers, which is the childcare workers and the Anganwadi helpers sitting on strike um, since December 8th. And, and they told me, I'm not personally gone and checked out, that most of the Anganwadi, which is the childcare centers are actually closed at the moment. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so, the latest data, as I say, you know, the, the NFHS 5 shows a very slow improvement in stunting and increase in anemia. Anemia is a big picture. 
We see, are we seeing a decline in the budget for the flagship nutrition schemes between 2015 and 2020 in real terms? So again, my question is, where are the people who will carry out these grand schemes? You know, I, um, in, in reply to a question in Parliament last year, actually, the Union Women um, and Child Development Ms., uh, Minister Shmiti Jubin Irani said, this is said on the floor of the Parliament, that something like 193,000 um, posts were lying vacant in Anganwadi, this is the child care centers, across the country at various levels. Out of these, uh, 129,000 posts are lying vacant in I think I think five states alone, and you've got you know, on your screen you can see the breakup. A very large number in Uttar Pradesh, which I mentioned, which also has a large burden of malnourished children. You know, um, again, this is official statistic. Another question uh, in response to an, a question on the floor of the parliament, the minister is saying we have uh, the figure of nine. Uh, 927 six years in severely acutely malnourished children um zero uh, six years have been identified in the country a very large number again are from uttar pradesh now many nutrition experts have recommended you know a second anganwadi worker in all the anganwadi centers overall there's about 1.4 billion but as i discovered while talking to anganwadi workers in haryana you know you i showed you the picture right in the beginning an affluent state close to delhi even the current lot gets a raw deal um not just that the child care centers are often in a terrible shape um some of the things they told me you see these pictures you know they say that they don't even have a uh, very many uh, they don't even have water in these centers now here are centers where actually little children come and they're there you know for a, uh, for quite some time during the day um they don't even have water they don't have electricity and they told me that uh sometimes not even chairs and when when the little children comes they have to go and they told me in hindi wale, you know makan se hum pani leke aate, which means that i go to the neighbors this is an anganwari helper told me that you know she goes to neighboring houses because it's, it's a closed community everybody knows everybody they go and fetch water you know this is you know and for, so that you know they can just function right now the point is that you know if you can have these grand visions grand schemes but if you're not you're spending money on this you know the, the overall how the child care center is uh strengthen the morale of the the child care workers and i will talk about that you know what what exactly are their demands how are you you know how are you going to achieve anything okay next slide yeah so 1.4 million Anganwadi workers and about 1.3 million Anganwadi helpers in the country. One of their long-standing demands is to be recognized as legitimate workers, given a salary, and you know, not being treated as volunteers. And, and, and right now they're given an honorarium. Now that honorarium itself varies from you know state to state. And what the reason why they are on the strike is because they say that the prime minister promised them, you know, a certain amount of money, extra money, which is actually a small 1,500 rupees, but in 2018 in a speech, but it hasn't been done. Now you may say, you know, why, why, you know, why are they going on strike? A very large number of these Anganwadi workers are actually widows. Uh, and they say that, you know, they, you know, they were given these jobs because they were widows. And and they really need this money uh, and this honorarium they know this is this whole business of can you actually run these massive nutrition schemes purely on the basis of what technically they're called voluntary the voluntary workers they don't really get salary and um you know the the, the government's official push is towards digital you know they've all been given uh um you know they've been asked to earlier they used to you know, have full, uh, sort of fill registers and things. They've been giving these, uh, you know, these digital uh, gadgets and, you know, you have to enter. Now, the problem over there, nobody's against digitization. The problem over there is a very large number of these workers are, you know, barely the school education, when you say the primary school or maybe like, a, a, you know, class seven, class eight. And there, some of them are quite old. They're not very uh, comfortable using this. And this is simultaneously, they're also filling the registrars and they get very little money. And they, they are not just doing childcare work. I mean, one of their biggest you know, grievances is that they said that if we are a volunteer, why are you telling us to do all these things during COVID, during the pandemic, they've been had a lot of COVID duties. Um, some of, I, I heard from an activist that they were even told to help out in some banking work. Um, so there's a whole lot of, uh, you know, just about lots of things are dumped on them and they're giving this, you know, honorarium. So that's a thing on whether 
you know, you can actually, why a community volunteer that template, whether that really works when you have, when the task at hand is so huge. Now you come to, you know, midday meals, which is like 120 million school going children who get a midday meal, often the only hot meal that they, you know, they, they sort of get in, in their in their whole day. Now with schools and Anganwadi closed, now they're opening up right now. Um, you know, if they don't get that midday meal, is still not being given everywhere. So there's a huge deprivation. Schools are reopening, but from what you hear, hot cooked midday meals are still not being given everywhere. Yeah. Next slide, please. Now, this is something which just yesterday I was, uh, you know, there was a webinar, what India's civil society is saying. There have been two surveys, uh, Hunger Watch Survey 1, which is uh, which was in December 2020, I think, the first wave of the pandemic. Now, the, there's this, this uh, Hunger Watch Survey 2, December 2021 to January 2022, commissioned by India's Right to Food campaign. This is a coalition of, um, you know, activists working on the grassroots on nutrition issues and the Center for Equity Studies, which is an NGO. And they've spoken to about, it's not a comprehensive survey, it's an observational one, and they say it's purposive. So it's not necessarily representative, but it gives you a flavor. More than 6,500 people in about 14 states, focusing specifically on the most marginalized community. So some of the top line findings, you see, Everybody's income, 66% of household samples said the income has come down from the pre-pandemic period. The rapid survey says food insecurity is much worse among households. This is the urban poor. Even in the absence of national lockdown, and I can tell you from my own, um, you know, my own insights when I talk to people, um, you know, just go to slums or go to ordinary people, uh, people say that you know, I, my, I'm getting about one third, like somebody who was earning 16,000 rupees earlier a month is getting only 7,000. The children, you know, they get some through the public distribution system, cereals, mainly cereals, you know, rice and wheat, but the other things they have to buy, and remember we have food inflation. So they are, um, you know, they are cutting down on milk, on vegetables, on, on, on all kinds of things. So there's 80% reported on some form of food security. You can see the statistics. Next slide, please. Yeah. Climate change is a new challenge for child nutrition. In addition to all these channels, we now have to factor in climate change. Several districts that face the twin challenges of climactic vulnerability and child malnutrition. And most of these districts already have poor health infrastructure in rural areas, low literacy, rudimentary sanitation and poverty. And again, there's a recent observational study which suggests that children living in these districts, which are highly vulnerable to climate, are also more likely to suffer from malnutrition. Next slide. Yeah, so these are some of the references. So, I mean, this is just, you know, a glimpse. And I think the point is that everything is connected. And um, when the government, uh, the government has a lot of schemes. Many people have been benefited, but these many of these schemes, you require documents. And there's still millions and millions of people who don't have necessarily the identity documents to be able to access these schemes. So there are millions of people who are falling through the cracks. And I think in the short term, medium term, and in the long term, we need to look at you know these people. And, uh, and, and basically the interventions are all interconnected. It's not just the, you know, the baby of the Women and Child Development Ministry or just nutrition interventions, everything is connected. And thank you very much. And I'm very happy to take questions later on brilliant thank you very much patrilaka and thank you also for for keeping to time as well that was very nicely timed presentation um, and really these really important points that you know will will we hopefully will will be picked up in the in the um the, the closing discussion so um let's just move on to the next um speaker um which is dr sharika yunus and we're really again delighted to have dr sharika here she's head of nutrition at the world food program um and she um as for her bio she graduated in in medicine from jnu uh, sorry Jawa, jn medical college in Aligarh in, in 2001. Um, and she's a gold medalist in community medicine and subsequently did her post graduation in community medicine from the same college in 2005. And she holds a diploma in public health nutrition from the Public Health Foundation, Foundation of India. And she has been trained on the management of nutrition in emergencies by U U University College London and Asian Disaster Preparedness Centre. 
Um, she has also worked on the ASHA project and the National Rural Health Mission with the Training Division, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare of the, of the Government of India. And she's worked as a focal point for nutrition at the World Health Organization Country Office for India. And currently she's working on the health um, uh, as the head of nutrition, as I, as I mentioned. So, um, Sharika, please take it away. Uh, thanks a lot, Hugh, for that uh, kind introduction. If you'll just give me a moment to get my slide up. Sure. Right. So, I um, I hope my presentation is visible. Yeah, um, thanks a lot uh, for laying. Thanks a lot, you. Um, and thanks so much, Patrilika, for laying uh, the background to my presentation. It just makes my job a lot more easier. Um, moving on to some data points that uh, Patrilika talked about in her presentation. Uh, so what you have here is the slide on the National Family Health Survey, which is conducted in our country uh, almost every four to five years. Um, and what you can see here that consistently between NFHS 3, which was conducted in 2008-9, NFHS 4, which was conducted in 2015-16, and NFHS 5, which was conducted bang in the middle of the pandemic between 2020 to 2021, we've been showing a consistent reduction in the prevalence of stunting. Uh, but the reduction, the speed of reduction is, is definitely slow. It's also slower than what the government itself had set out as targets for itself. Uh, so as per the portion of beyond, the annual target is about two percentage points per annum. Uh, but we are, you know, lagging quite a bit behind that target as well. Uh, also, if this is the speed at which we are bringing down the prevalence of stunting, um, the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, all the World Health Assembly targets uh, seem far off. Um, a couple of very interesting points from from NFHS 4, because the full data sets and the full analysis for NFHS 5 is still not available, um, is that children in India, even less than six months are stunted, which then means that there's a lot which is happening in utero. Um, uh, there's a lot of impact of the mother's nutrition on the child. Um, and the prevalence of stunting in gradually increases to reach a, a very high level when a child is about 18 to 23 months of age. Uh, that's also when the children are learning to move about. It's also when, uh, you know, uh, uh, foods have been introduced into the diet of the child. Uh, the child's gradually being moved from breast milk to, uh, to a diet, um, to a household diet, and uh, we see a prevalence, increase in the prevalence of stunting there. Thereafter, after 24 months, the prevalence does begin to come down, but it remains consistently high. Uh, what we also know is that the prevalence of stunting is very high in the scheduled tribes and the scheduled castes in our country. There's also a very strong link uh, between a mother's schooling or the number of years she spent on education and the prevalence of stunting. Uh, so uh, the lesser the number of years of schooling, the higher is the prevalence of stunting in, um, in the children of such mothers. Um, the stunting's also been found to be linked to the mother's own nutritional status. Uh, so if a mother is underweight, there's a higher prevalence of stunting in the children of such a mother. Uh, stunting is across all the wealth quintiles in India, but the highest prevalence is in the lower wealth quintiles. Uh, so just a couple of points, which also uh, then bring us to, uh, uh, to the conclusion that if you want to address stunting, uh, there's a whole lot that needs to be done as uh, far as some of the very basic causes of malnutrition are concerned. Um, so this is the prevalence of stunting uh, from the latest NFHS 5 across the different states and uh, union territories in the country. Um, and what this data shows, if you compare it between NFHS 4 and NFHS 5, is um, that by and large, stunting has reduced in about 19 states in the country. Uh, the prevalence of stunting uh, continues to remain status quo in about four states' union territories. And there are quite a few states where the prevalence of stunting has actually increased between the previous round of the NFHS and the current round of the NFHS. Uh, 
Now, stunting, as we all know, uh, is uh, is largely it's it's an indicator uh, and the best predictor of human capital. Uh, stunting in the first two years of life causes irreversible damage, resulting in shorter adult height, lower schooling attainment, reduced adult income, and um, if such a, a girl child was to have an offspring, then the offspring in turn would also have a lower birth weight. Uh, now, why do we have stunting? This is the UNICEF conceptual framework for malnutrition. Uh, stunting uh, or malnutrition per se has a set of immediate causes, which are largely uh, because of an increased frequency in diseases, because of a gap in food intake, vis a vis what a recommended dietary allowance should be. There are then a whole set of underlying causes which are reflected through caring practices for women and children, uh, largely household food security, insufficient maternal and child care, and insufficient health services and poor sanitation. And then there are some very, very basic causes like the lack of uh, capital, financial, human, physical uh, resources, and the political, socioeconomic context. Just give me a minute. I Let me just get everything up and then perhaps I'll sort of talk about it. Um, so what could be the solution or what is the evidence-based solution that the rest of the world follows as far as, uh, you know, addressing standing is concerned and the solutions packaged largely around nutrition specific interventions and nutrition sensitive interventions. Um, and you have all the nutrition specific interventions which are listed here. Um, in a country like India, like Patrilekha spoke, um, you know, we have no dearth of policies and programs and schemes, etc. And for everything that is listed here under nutrition specific interventions, it's in place in India. Uh, but again, like she said, it's implementation, which is key. We are paper tigers, uh, but on ground, the implementation is where we show a huge lack. Uh, also, as far as the nutrition specific interventions are concerned, even when they are implemented at scale, uh, there's only 20% of stunting in children that we can hope to address, uh, which then opens the entire window of opportunity as far as nutrition sensitive interventions are concerned. And therefore, uh, you know, increasingly we need to focus on nutrition sensitive interventions as much as we focus on nutrition specific interventions. Uh, now, as the World Food Program, uh, what is it that we do in India? And um, our focus has largely been on the government's food-based safety nets. Uh, a couple of reasons why we are so focused on the food-based safety nets, because most of these food-based safety nets are universal. Uh, they're far-reaching, covering millions of the Indian population. And therefore, if you're able to bring about any incremental improvement in these food-based safety nets, you're playing a huge part in addressing stunting and malnutrition in the country. Uh, the three food-based safety nets, which are also covered under the National Food Security Act that Patrileka spoke to, are the targeted public distribution system. Uh, under the targeted public distribution system, there's a monthly ration. Uh, which is distributed to the poorest of the poor households, as well as to priority households. Um, then we have the Integrated Child Development Services Scheme, which covers children less than six years of age, pregnant lactating women, and out-of-school adolescent girls. And then we have the PM Portion Scheme, uh, which was the erstwhile midday meal scheme, which covers children uh, between the ages of six to 14 years, studying between grades one to eight, uh, wherein a school meal is available to them um, as a hot cooked meal in schools. Um, and as you can see, the coverage of each of these schemes runs into many, many millions. So as the World Food Program, we've largely been focused uh, on bringing in efficiency in the implementation of the schemes, as well as bringing nutritional effectiveness in the implementation of the schemes. Uh, when as, as far as nutritional effectiveness is concerned, we've been working towards mainstreaming large-scale food fortification. Uh, we've been working on social behavior change communication and teaching, uh, uh, helping and enhancing the awareness of the community on different aspects of nutrition and, and what is it that they can do with what is available to them to enhance their nutritional status. Uh, we've been working on infant and young child feeding, setting up kitchen gardens, et cetera. 
what we do largely um, uh, because uh, irrespective of uh, you know uh, the development partner presence in india uh, we are still very very small to what the government of india does and what the government of india can do um, and therefore we work on a pilot to scale up approach we come in with a country with an evidence based proven intervention we pilot it in a sizable geography and once we are convinced that it's making a change uh, in the nutrition and food security status of individuals, then we take it to the national government for mainstreaming it in, it, in its policies and programs. Um, and while addressing that, there are quite a few cross-cutting issues in terms of WASH, food safety, hygiene, climate change, uh, emergency uh, uh, mitigation, et cetera, that we also address. Um, in the slides coming now, I'm going to focus on one particular scheme of the government, which is the Integrated Child Development Services Scheme, uh, which Patrilekha also spoke to. And the reason behind this is it, it caters to children less than five years of age. Um, and therefore, this is the nutrition scheme of the government. Uh, the beneficiaries of the scheme, like we said, are children less than six years of age and pregnant lactating women. The scheme uh, provides a set of six services, which include supplementary nutrition, preschool education, uh, nutrition and health education, immunization, health checkups, and referrals. Uh, the supplementary nutrition is provided in two ways. Um, one is it's provided as hot cooked meal to children three to six years of age who are old enough to come to the Anganwadi Center or the Maternal and Child Health Nutrition Centers. And then it's provided as a take home ration, uh, which is given, uh, delivered either on a weekly basis or a fortnightly basis, or even in some cases on a monthly basis to children six to 36 months of age and to pregnant lactating women. Um, as the World Food Program in 2018, we undertook a review of what is distributed as take home rations throughout the country, especially what is distributed as take home ration uh, to young children. And uh, what we found was that the products, uh, that the take home ration, which is distributed in some states, it could be just dry rations consisting of wheat and pulses. But in some states, it was, uh, you know, blended foods. And most of what was distributed adhered to the ICDS norms. Uh, the ICDS norms for the different beneficiary categories that it caters to are largely around calories and proteins. Uh, but when we went deeper into what is distributed as take-home rations, what we found was that in meeting the caloric norm, so the caloric norm for young children six to 36 months as per the government of India is that you should be able to provide 500 kilocalories through the take-home ration on a daily basis. What we saw that most of the states were doing was to meet this caloric norm of 500 kilocalories, states were pushing in large quantities of sugar. Um, and there's a reason why the states were pushing in large quantities of sugar. Thanks, Ayu. Um, it was uh, largely because there is a financial no norm which is attached to the per day beneficiary. And within that financial it's easy to put in large amounts of sugar and therefore pass on a product to a young child. Uh, the fat content in the take-home rations meant for young children were very low. The quality of protein was suboptimal. The products were not fortified, meaning they were you know, visibly and exceptionally low on vitamins and minerals. The products in our country were produced through a mix of a centralized uh, modality wherein you hire private sector companies or public sector enterprises to produce the take home ration and then it gets distributed. Or in some states, it was done through a decentralized modality wherein women's self-help group produced the take home rations. Um, the take home rations was exceptionally low as far as implementation on quality assurance and quality control protocols were concerned. And what we found that in most states, uh, what was happening was that um, by the time the product had already been consumed by the end beneficiary, that is when the lab reports on the quality of the product were coming in. So there was really no synchronization between lab testing and when the reports were coming in. Um, and lastly, um, the government uh, spends a huge amount of funds as far as supplementary nutrition in the ICDS is concerned. Um, but when you look at the frontline functionaries, the Anganwari workers, 
uh, they just think that it's their duty to pick up a packet of the THR and pass it on to the beneficiary, how it needs to be consumed, how is it useful, how many times should it be consumed. None of that information is passed on to the mother. So there's a complete disconnect between the THR and the nutrition health education, which should be happening. Um, as WFP, we feel that it's very important to focus on take-home rations because in many, many families, um, many millions of families, the take-home ration is the uh, source of food uh, for, uh, for young children. Um, and it's, um, I mean, these schemes are universal. If it is a good product, which is given to a young child, it could be very well leveraged to also prevent malnutrition um, in the country. Um, also, products for young children of this age, as per the global guidance, um, you know, uh, the products should have, should provide at least 0.8 kilocalories per gram. Uh, the product should have about 10 to 15 percent of energy as proteins. Um, the products should uh, have, you know, the energy contribution from sugars should be less than 10 percent. Uh, what we noted was that the average energy contribution for such products across the country was as high as 23 percent, so about more than double of what the global guidance says. Uh, the product should ideally contain some milk powder. Um, um, and this is, uh, milk powder is supposed to have a lengthening effect on children. Um, and uh, it should be fortified, et cetera, et cetera. So these are what the global guidance is for such products. And it is uh, possible to adhere to those global guidance even within the ICDS norms, uh, but it just requires some out of the box thinking. Um, Oh, sorry, I, I think I just went a bit overboard with animations. Um, so um, as, as WFP, we've been taking a systemic approach in the states where we work um, to improve the quality of the take-home rations. Uh, we've been working on improving the nutritional composition of the take-home ration. There's a lot of R&D uh, work that's gone in in terms of production trials, shelf life, getting a product which is actually acceptable to people. Uh, we are also working in Uttar Pradesh, uh, which moved from a centralized THR production to a decentralized THR production model by setting up THR production units, developing quality assurance, quality control protocols, working on aspects of labeling and packaging, and also working at the last mile to ensure that the product which is distributed is distributed to mothers and caregivers with the right knowledge and importance on the product by the frontline functionaries. So it's been a systemic end-to-end -end approach that we're working on in terms of the take-home rations in Uttar Pradesh. Um, this is a picture from one of the units that we've set up in, um, in one of the districts in Uttar Pradesh. The unit's been set up at, at a block level. Um, uh, it engages about 20 women who run the unit. The women have been trained on all aspects of financial literacy, SOPs on production, et cetera. Uh, each unit is uh, capable of producing two and a half metric tons of take home ration in an eight hour shift. And if they run double shifts, they can produce about five metric tons per day. Each unit produces nine different variants of the take home rations. Um, and that also lends a certain level of uh, you know, diversity. It's not easy for children, especially young children to be consuming the same product as take home ration every day. So we've tried to build in some diversity as well. Um, and the women who are working in this unit earn about 8,000 Indian rupees per month. So it's also giving them a source of um, income. This is my last slide, Hugh. Um, in this model that we have set up, which is gradually being taken to scale on Uttar Pradesh and was actually inaugurated by the Prime Minister of India in the last week, uh, in the last month of 2021, uh, what we found works well is that apart from this entire nutritional focus and its link to stunting, uh, it promotes income generation activities and it's leading to women empowerment. Uh, it promotes a lot of these local agricultural economies because a lot of the raw materials for the production of the take-home ration are procured locally. There's more community ownership of the take-home ration because it's produced by their own women and therefore the community owns it and you know there's more acceptability. Uh, the women, it's 
their own local women producing it. Uh, therefore, it's very closely aligned to their local tastes as well. There's um, uh, since it's locally available, there isn't too much time which is spent in the supply chain, and therefore the shelf life is, you know, though it's a good three months, but it's available to the community as soon as it's produced. So there's no time lost in the shelf life. Um, the challenges, of course, are on the financial viability as a whole of this particular unit and trying to, you know, you need to consistently hammer into these women the importance of quality assurance and quality control. Um, that's the end of my slide. I'm sorry if I went a bit over time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you very much. So, Will, um, I, it, it was really interesting um, listening to both of those excellent presentations to, you know, obviously to, to, to particularly think about how both of you picked up on these points about interconnectedness and how, you know, there are so many important aspects for um, the, you know, determining um, progress on stunting, not just the, not just implementation, which you both indicated is key, but also on um, the economy and agriculture and, and climate change and so on. So we have a, um, we have a couple of, Q and A questions which have come in. One of them is about the private sector, and the other is about the um, the, the public sector incentives. So, on on the private sector point, Greg Cooper's. Um, I, I don't know if anybody, can anybody, everybody, do you want me to read out these questions, Greg? Greg Cooper is suggesting that having a growers for um, ad addressing. Um, and under nutrition, or I think that's my that's my s summary of of what he seems to be presenting. So um, his 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 question is that of course you know these outlets are skewed towards the upper middle and the um, class and the the urban people. So could there be an approach that could? Oh, attendees can't see the questions. Thank you, Chelsea. Okay, so I need to, to I, I actually need to read it out. So for those of you that aren't aware, Grofers, um, those of you in India will be well aware of Grofers. Um, I think the closest approximation for those of you that are joining in the UK um, would be um, delivery or, or something something like this. I think I'm, I'm correct. So, so, um, do you, so the, the question to the panelists is, do you perceive a future where these more modern forms of marketing could be scaled up and made more equitable or accessible to poorer and rural people. So why don't we um, take that question to um, Patrulaka first? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Grofers and Swiggy and Zomato, this is great for, you know, middle class, upper middle class, metropolitan, even city people. But as I understand it, the problem why people are malnourished is not because it's the means of, you know, it's not whether it's, uh, you know, it's how they get this because they don't have money. You know, they're cutting down on food because uh, they just don't have money if you're earning, let's say, $100. You are earning $100 a month and now you're earning $20 a month then it's not it's not the means of delivery you know is the i mean this is the star the elephant in the root people don't have money and the economy is not doing well and now with you know you, even things like development in ukraine it is going to push up petrol prices it's going to have a knock-on effect on every bit so i think that is the ele elephant in the root the deepening inequalities and poverty people don't have money you know, they, they're an informal sector. So, uh, yes, I think uh, I think a lot of people in the in the cities are using it. And it's not just the, the upper middle class, even lower middle class during the pandemic. We've seen that, you know, when we couldn't go out online delivery that was allowed, even when restaurants were closed. But I think the stunting, I mean, it's a question of, you know, whose children are stunted and what is their universe? And who are the ones you're using? So I think we are talking about really at the bottom, you know? So even if it's, let's say 10% or even 15%, that's still millions. That's still millions of people. Like Sharika talked about Uttar Pradesh, 200 million people. That's Brazil. So even if it's 10% of that population, which is right at the bottommost, uh, uh, you know, the bottommost, that's we're still talking. They need money. They need resources. You know, so I, I personally, yes, maybe in the very, very long term, once we are all at a you know more equitable society, 
I think, yes, definitely. I have nothing against Zomato or Swiggy or Rofers. I use it myself. But I don't think my child is not stunted, unlikely to be, you know, because, you know, <laughs> all the indicators that we talked about, they doesn't apply. But this is not about my child or the children of people like me. This is about the most vulnerable, the most, the, the poorest. So that's my take on it. But yeah, I mean, it could definitely be ha happen maybe, you know, way, way down the line. Sh sh thank you. Um... Uh, Sharika, do you, do, you, do you want to respond to that key question? Uh, sure. Um, so the issue, um, I would think, I think Patrulekha sort of spoke for both of us. The only couple of points that I would want to add is that uh, in the rural markets in India, you know, uh, everything's penetrated down to the rural markets in, in India, the Pepsis, uh, the late shift, et cetera. So it's not an issue of availability. It is available. Um, the issue is of purchasing power. Uh, the issue also what is gradually setting up in the Indian context is that, um, you know, uh, since uh, the people in the lower wealth quintiles or in the rural areas see a lot of their urban counterparts uh, having Pepsis and, you know, late chips, they think that is the right nutrition, you know, often mothers in the rural areas, if they have little money available to them, they pass it on to uh, the elder sibling, and say, you know, this is what needs, go to the shop and buy a pack of lace chips. And they think that's what all nutrition is all about. So one, it's about purchasing power. The second, it's also about knowledge and awareness and what is good nutrition. Um, so I think those are the two additional points that I'd just like to add to what Patrick has said. Over. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, just to add on to Sharika, I actually uh, uh, filed a report for the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health a couple of years ago from Dharavi, which is you know Asia's largest slum. What is very interesting is junk food uh, is actually being miniaturized. So, and this is very, very dangerous. So even when people have no money, then they won't go and have, say, fruit juice or banana. They would go and have junk food like chips and, you know, what Charika mentioned. And these are available in very small sachets, just like lipstick. Cosmetic manufacturers got onto this very, very early, you know. So you get these one rupee, two rupee versions of, you know, a, a lot of sugar, sugar uh, food, uh, high salt food. And I've seen children, their mothers, you know, in Dharavi, um, which is in, in Bombay, Mumbai, uh, with with holding on to somebody below six months, they're being initiated into the sugary stuff, even as they're being breastfed. Once they get it into the sugar fix, they don't want to have anything else. And this is marketing, you know, this is this is penetrated in the deepest, even when there are places where there are no toilets or where think there is junk food. So I think this is, you know, this is this is a, a very dangerous phenomenon, the miniaturization and the, the cheaper version, sachets of junk food. Yeah. Okay, so um, Gun, um, I'm going to, and participants, I'm going to hope it's okay, and panelists, if we go over by a couple of minutes, um, I hope that's all right with you both, because it's, uh, it's just yeah. really, really interesting hearing more, as much from you as we possibly can. So um, there's a second question which has come in from Steve Allen, who's, um, which is more on the public sector, and I think he's picking up on this, um, the point that um, Sharika was making, I, I wonder about in utero um, stunting. Um, so he says, excellent presentations. How can we align nutrition cycles with political cycles? Improving nutrition must address pregnancy in young children aged zero to two years. But the benefits in terms of the improved human potential to help fix the problems highlighted will take 20 years when these babies are young adults. Is that time frame too long for politicians? So I'm going to ask the um, Sharika to respond to that first, please. So sure, thanks you. Um, no, I think that's spot on. Um, it, I mean, the nutrition cycle is completely not in alignment with the political cycle, and uh, these young babies today are not the vote bank for politicians, right? So, uh, but their moms are. Uh, but the other thing is um, what we see in India is that malnutrition is invisible because everybody, you know, the prevalence is so high that in the rural community, uh, you know, uh, it's very difficult to distinguish between somebody who's malnourished and somebody who's not malnourished. Um, but what, there was a talk one, upon, you know, once upon a time in terms of 
uh, sensitizing the politicians on malnutrition because they need to understand what, what it really means and the, the general understanding on malnutrition not only in the community but also in many higher ups seems to be lacking so they need to be sensitized and if we could uh, sort of have like a constituency wise uh, you know debates in terms of what's the prevalence of malnutrition in your district and how do you hope to address it uh, I think the onus lies on us how we get it into the political discourse and how we embed it into the political discourse and also an enhancing community awareness on it so the community is empowered to ask the right questions um, that would be my take on it uh, Patraleka over to you well, I mean, I once wrote a column on why hunger doesn't make headlines. And I think I think this is definitely an issue because um, India has, uh, you know, so many competing problems that malnutrition, you know, which is really slow, uh, I would say slow death in many ways, because you may not drop down dead, but uh, children's if they're if they're not getting proper nutrition in the first three years, then they're they're uh, brain is brain development doesn't happen their life options become less i think these are not really issues but i think if you look at india you know the southern states and i gave an example of tamil nadu you know in my presentation the you know how they're something i think is like less than 25 percent where it is happening i personally am very cynical about politicians taking the lead on this i think it's the voters you know women's education so how is it that the southern states where the education the women's literacy, you know, other other indicators are higher. They've also got their child nutrition. Um, it's still not perfect, but much, much better than, say, states like Uttar Pradesh or Madhya Pradesh or most of the Hindi speaking states in the north. So I think it's I think it's the awareness. But that saying that I think there's also the issue that just education in the sense of a degree doesn't necessarily mean you're nutritionally literate. I've come across, I mean, right around South Delhi, if, you know, if you go to the markets nowadays, you'll see a lot of middle class women, you know, put, feeding their children with lots of sugary stuff and they're eating. And in fact, one of the most interesting things in India from the NFHS5, um, even in the poor districts, in the poor states, you know, child obesity is going up. That's very interesting. Alongside undernutrition, overnutrition, of course, undernourished are more than overnourished. And that is, I personally think, I mean, Sharika would know more, is because you're eating junk food. You, you're eating. So your, you know, your belly is full, but you're eating junk food. And I think definitely awareness. And in states where the awareness means you're more demanding, the electorate is more demanding. You know, hopefully we can make this into a political issue. As a journalist, I can only write. <laughs> That's all I do, actually. Um, so I, I, so I, I think that um, I think we probably need to end it there. So I, I must say I've just really enjoyed hearing both of these presentations. I don't know if there's a, an, a way for people to, to maybe in the chat to send their thanks and applause to to our excellent panel. And um, I, I don't think I think we should probably leave it there. Um, Sharika, I did want to you, you did mention this important point about the focus on take home rations. And I, I was I was going to quiz you a bit on the some of the issues that are found with, you know, called substitution and leakages of take home rations, you know, whether it's they're actually given to the the um, index children that are supposed to receive them and, and whether they're given actually as additional rather than as 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 uh, as additional meals but but perhaps we, we can leave that to another um, session so just thank you thank you both so much and um, we will um, um, we will uh, look forward to the next action against stunting hub webinar thank you so thank you. much and thanks for having me um, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Um, just to mention, we'll publish a recording on this uh, event on uh, the Action Against Stunting Hub's website uh, probably early next week. Great. Tag us so we can retweet and share and, uh, you know, amplify some of the messages. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed being part of this conversation. Perfect. Will do. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.